Hello and welcome to this week's video. I hope everybody's staying safe. This week what I've decided to do is, um, and this video is actually prompted by a couple of comments I've had on my previous wildlife videos where uh, people are saying to me, oh, you know, love, love watching the videos but I just can't see myself doing any sort of that wildlife photography because you know, I'm, I'm not as mobile as I used to be or you know, I've got mobility issues. And that really got me thinking that, you know, photography in all its genres should really be inclusive to everybody and wildlife photography shouldn't really be any different. So what I thought I'd do today is go through my five tips that I think that anybody can use, um, but particularly if you're a less mobile um, photographer, you know, if you're sort of you've got uh, a disability or or perhaps you're an older photographer and you think that wildlife photography is something that you know just young people do um, hopefully these tips will convince you that you know wildlife photography is no different to any other type of photography and you can still do it if you have mobility issues anyway without further ado we'll crack on here are my five tips that hopefully will convince you that whatever mobility issues you have you can still do some wildlife photography. Right, my first tip, and this is one that uh, you're probably getting sick of me saying it actually on my other wildlife videos, and um, you know, I'll put a link up here to, to those, um, and there'll also be a link in the description. Basically, if you want to start wildlife photography, the best place to start is your own garden especially if you've got mobility issues because obviously if you've got a garden and you've got mobility issues that garden you know you've set it up for you so that you can enjoy that garden so you can also enjoy that garden for wildlife photography and what I mean by that is you can encourage the wildlife to come to you to a certain extent so things like you know putting a bird table up in your garden or bird feeders that will encourage the birds in and again you know you can take images of those I have a video on setting up uh, bird feeders in your garden which again I'll put a link up there to that but more than that you know you can encourage the birds in with a bird table but even things like um, probably the next thing that you can do is have a pond in your garden now when I say a pond you know I don't mean you've got to spend thousands of pounds having a massive you know trench and wide pond with pond liners etc put into your garden if you can do that that's brilliant you know that will encourage wildlife into there but anything from an upturned dustbin lid uh, that's got water in it to you know it's something as simple as an old um, kids you know paddling pool um, within a couple of months you'll start to get you know things coming to that the birds for a start will drink water out of it if you keep the water in it um, very soon you'll find that plants are starting to grow in there they're starting to get some silt on the bottom and once all that happens you then start to get things like um, you know damselflies and dragonflies frogs um, will come to the pond you might start to get things like newts uh, you might get hedgehogs drinking from that pond so it, it, it works as like a little um, oasis for wildlife really and that's something you can develop over time the more time a pond is in the garden you'll find the more stuff that you're getting in it um, so that's my another thing with your your sort of your garden that you can do you're in full control of it so you can put all that in there now what I would also say as regards your garden um, what people do forget to do is they'll put fences up around their garden and walls and completely seal it off from everything else now if you think about it, your garden is a perfect corridor for wildlife to use to get from one place to another. So if you do simple things like leave a gap under your uh, fence or whatever at certain points so that you know, if you border on a park or, or anything else that something can come into your garden from somewhere else. It can cross over and come through your garden and then perhaps into another garden. Um, so don't forget to sort of look at things like that. Now, because it's your garden what you can also do is control the plants that you put in your garden and if you make your plants friendly for wildlife so you know things like plants to encourage butterflies um, plants to encourage birds so that they can feed on the seed heads and things in the autumn all that sort of stuff will help and you're in full control of that it's your garden you can decide what you're putting in there to attract stuff in 
Now what I would also say, something that I've used really successfully over the years and I still lo love doing today is, probably about 15 years ago now I got myself a moth trap and this was a purpose made one, it was actually, I think it only cost me, it cost me about 50 quid and, and all it consists of really is a plastic box with a lid on it and a circular light with a tube going down into the box and basically from that what you do is you you put egg boxes or something in the box at the bottom put that out in the evenings leave it there all night in the garden in the morning you'll come back and you'll have loads of moths on the um, egg boxes inside the inside the plastic container now why that is so good is if you think about it that there's a number of species of butterflies that we get in this country but that is probably tenfold you know increase if you look at the amount of moths we've got and people tend to think moths uh, are quite drab um, I can tell you from my own experience they come in every colour and um, size and the patterns are, are also absolutely fantastic and you know you, you can do all that from your back garden and again you can put plants around your garden and in your garden that will encourage those moths in I will put a link to where I got my moth trap from I don't think they actually do this one anymore some of the commercial ones are quite expensive but for me that's one of the main things that you know in your garden you can do and you can have hours and hours and hours of fun just doing that from probably about April to October now I think point two I think you really need to look at the kit that you're using for wildlife photography I know um, you know if you sort of look at some of the photographers on YouTube and they'll they may do a video where they say my wildlife photography kit and you look at it and they've got you know lenses this sort of long and, and this wide and tripods that look like pieces of you know cast iron that they, and they've got a massive gimbal head on the top now all that stuff is absolutely fantastic it's brilliant and it does a wonderful job but if you've got mobility issues what you've got to do is try and sort your kit for you now it might not be ideal for somebody else you know they might want something bigger or wider or faster or whatever but you need to sort something that you're going to be able to carry and that you're going to use if you don't use it it's a complete waste of time I mean I can relate to this a little bit although I don't particularly have any mobility issues what my type of wildlife photography is I like to stalk wildlife more than sort of sit in a hide so I, my kit has to be pared down so that I can carry it and I can crawl around with it so I don't want anything particularly heavy um, or cumbersome because I'm actually having to get into a position with my kit and stalk that wildlife which if I'd got a massive 600mm lens on a massive tripod that I've got to carry across my back there's no way I can stalk wildlife with that so kit is very individual and that means that you know I'm happy with a 100-400mm zoom lens uh, a Sigma that is quite lightweight now if if you're finding that stuff like that is too heavy you might just say well I'm just gonna have a 300mm lens you know which is even lighter and I'm gonna give up the fact that I've not got as much reach um, and it might not be perfect but I'm actually gonna carry it with me when I go out doing some wildlife photography I'm not just gonna leave it at home and say look it's too heavy for me to lift you know I can't carry it you know if, if you can't handle a you know a, a, a massively um, sturdy tripod that everybody's saying to you oh you need this to carry this kit because you're doing wildlife photography and it has to be this you know go for a lightweight travel tripod it might not be as sturdy it might you know fail on occasion and you might get some vibration and it might ruin a shot but at least it's better than having nothing and not taking it with you you see what I'm saying the, your hit rate of shots might be might be less but you're actually taking it with you and doing some photography so I think that's always important to consider is not to sort of look at somebody's video on kit and think well you know I can't do it because I've got to have this and it weighs this you know a, a, a carbon fibre travel, travel tripod is much better than having no tripod at all or having an expensive heavy tripod designed to carry big he heavy kit that you're not going to carry because it's too too much for you Right, I've just moved away, a little bit further away from the A1 and some of my regular subscribers may recognise this gantry behind me. I've photographed it before in some of my landscape videos. Um, it's somewhere I always return back to. Cormorants and heron. <laughs> I think I surprised them. I think they were just going to come and land down here. There's a little bit of sandbank which I want to talk about. 
um, a little bit in a while. Um, I've actually just noticed something down there that I wanted to point out on this video which is quite pertinent to the point I'm mentioning at the minute. Yeah, I think if you've got enough mobility, um, and this is point three, to move into sort of your local area and walk around that a little bit, um, the advantage you've got there, and again I've mentioned this in my other videos, is it's your local area, so if it's an area that you're in quite a lot, then even if it's just walking the dog and you you're not got your camera with you, you can still be doing what I would call you know field study, so you're still looking out for things. And um, a typical example this morning, actually I've just walked here to, to film this and I thought well that gantry will make quite, some, quite a nice backdrop. Down here there's a little bit of a sandbar, it's only a tiny little thing and, and the Trent actually is tidal here so it does um, you know, rise and fall with the tide and there's a little bit of a sandbar and there's some footprints across it. Now if I tell you like six to eight weeks ago when we were all in flood here about ooh, a mile away from here I was walking the dog in the morning actually in the opposite direction towards Sutton on Trent and there was, a, there was an otter um, it's the first otter I've seen in the Trent um, you know, ever, all the time I've been living here. And I know now they are in all British rivers uh, that have been seen in them. So it's quite exciting to see that. And I'm just wondering if these footprints down here potentially could be otter. I think they might be fox, I'm not sure. But what I've done, I've just took a quick picture on my phone. And then I'll, when I get back home, I'll have a look in one of my field guides and look at the footprint and see what it is. And you know, then I know, again, I'm doing a little bit of field work even now. That potentially could lead to to something in the future it could lead to me you know staking out this area so anyway that's one of the points about your local area and a good example of that is you know it so you can do that field work and find where potentially you've got wildlife now <clears throat> when you do that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have to crawl around after the wildlife I've got another couple of examples actually right behind the house um, and there's a little walk I do with the dog in the evening, I don't take her as far, I only take her about, it's probably less than a mile and it's just around this little tiny spit of a field, not a lot to it at all but it borders on the back which is like a small stream that runs into the Trent which runs behind our house and I noticed that there's a lovely deep pool that's been gouged out um, because of all the flood water we've had going down there and it just looks absolutely ideal for kingfishers so what I've done is I've put a perch in there and that's somewhere that um, you know if, if on, on an evening or if I've got a spare hour I can just walk out the back door and basically go and lie down on the banking of the back with the camera on a tripod and just wait and see if anything turns up now you don't really have to be very mobile to do that you know it's it's all about observation really and what I've also done behind the house, because we're in lockdown at the minute and I can't really go far, the little woodland that borders on the back where the kingfishers are, what happened is when the Trent flooded, it brought loads of driftwood down the Trent, which basically stuck in the hedges. And, you know, that line of that wood I know is pretty good for roe deer. So what I've done is um, I've just got some of that driftwood and made a sort of a bit of a hide under a, an old hawthorn tree that's covered in ivy um, and basically all I need to do then is I can walk there in the morning when it's still dark go and sit under there put some scrim netting around the front the camera up and I'm basically I've got a view of that whole edge of the woodland with the sun coming up and shining down onto there and potentially got any creatures that come out of the wood like us, they like to take a little bit of the sun when the sun first comes up, that early morning warmth as the sun hits. And again, it's not taking a lot of effort. Now, if you've got mobility issues, I'm not suggesting that you start hacking away and building hides, but, you know, if you're walking there every day, you can just pile things up. You don't even have to, you don't even have to do that. You can just go and sit up again with your back up against a tree or whatever and use a bit of scrim netting to cover yourself up, get the camera there and just have an hour there you know you're not really having to do anything other than walk and sit down so that's that's my third tip is don't negate you know don't discount your local area you know it the best and you can use that to your advantage and as I say wildlife is not all about crawling around after things sometimes you can just go and sit and wait and, and see what turns up but your knowledge will help you 
have more productive time sitting there if you are looking for things as you're out and about. Right, my fourth point is really, it's the opposite to point three in a way. If you really have some mobility issues, then there is a great way to get some uh, wildlife photography is to look to your local wildlife trusts or something like the RSPB. If you go on their websites, you'll see that, particularly with their flagship sites, so the ones that, you know, um, are sort of national, nationally renowned sites, or the biggest, bigger sites, I know the one, sort of the Wildlife Trust ones near me are the Idle Valley and um, the Attenborough Nature Reserve for Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. What they tend to do is, especially with those reserves, they have a lot of disabled access. As I say, they want to make watching wildlife inclusive for everybody. So that, what that means is that then that opens that up for actually doing some wildlife photography there as well. So what you may find is that, and I, I, what I suggest is before you go to these places, is, is check on their websites and it will list what, what disabled access they've got. So what you'll find is that they'll have um, proper trackways so that you've got wheel, wheelchair access. You know, you're not walking around a, down a muddy track. Um, it's a, a proper metal surface so that you can get access with a wheelchair. And their hides will also have um, ramped access so that you can get into there and wider doors so that you can go in. And you know, you'll have you know members of staff who, who, who are quite happy to help you get into there and get some access and then you can sit in a in a hide. The, the advantage of, of that as well is that if you you know if you want to, to um, have more interaction with people while you're doing your wildlife photography that's a great way to do it. You know it can be quite a solitary thing uh, which I like you know I like the solitude and, and being able to get there on, out there on my own but that's not for everybody some people like it to be more of a social thing and that's definitely a way to do that you know if you're in these hides then people will be coming in and and um, you know looking for birds and whatever else and you know you can have a chat while you're there so that's a, a good way to do that if you've not really got that mobility at all and uh, following on from that if you really want to get exotic um, what I can't recommend enough is visiting something like uh, the Rutland Water Bird Fair which is obviously held at Rutland Water, I think it's in August and what you'll find there not only have they got every piece of equipment for wildlife watching and wildlife filming and wildlife um, you know stills photography they've also got uh, there must be at least three or four marquees full of companies that will provide um, holidays to anywhere in the world from Costa Rica to New Zealand to Greenland to um, South Africa anywhere you can think of to not only watch wildlife to, but to photograph wildlife and most of those will have facilities to get people who are less mobile to areas where they can watch and photograph wildlife now the only problem with that is um, do take your credit card with you because um, you won't want for a brochure but you you will need your credit card um, it can get quite expensive and I think you can spend as much as you want you know on those sort of trips but it, again you know if you want to photograph some more exotic wildlife and you think that you can't you'll never be able to do it then that's definitely wrong um, you know these companies are set up to help you do that right my fifth and final point and and this really is one that as a wildlife photographer you should be doing a lot of anyway but it's an area where especially if you're a less experienced photographer it's an area that often you try and skip and you can find that if you skip it you are wasting an awful lot of time and effort and energy um, and that is to do your research now I know that might seem like you know it's not it's not actually doing any wildlife photography and you know it's a it's a bit of a bind it's a bit like schoolwork you don't really want to do it but trust me if you do it you can really save yourself a lot of time and energy a bit further down the line um, I've got a perfect example of this when I first started doing wildlife photography and it was actually the thing that got me into wildlife photography it must be 15 years ago and um, I happened to be walking around the edge of this woodland and this huge bird flew up and it was a buzzard and I'd never been that close to or seen a buzzard um, at that time, bearing in mind this is in Nottinghamshire and I know it's difficult to believe but in Nottinghamshire 15 years ago 
you were very lucky to see a buzzard. Um, they were very, very rare. So I set about over a period of a couple of months setting hides up in that area and I remember one specific time lying down for about seven hours under an electricity pile on the in a hide that I'd made with bracken lying on the floor and I think it was about minus seven for about seven hours um, and I'd got a dead pheasant out in front of me and this buzzard eventually landed on this dead pheasant but my back was killing me and I had to look over the top of the camera and as the, the moment I did that I looked over the top of the camera and this buzzard had landed I hadn't seen it there at all all this time and she took one look at me flew off and I never got a picture now that's an interesting story yeah lovely but I never got a picture of a buzzard and, and the reason was is I hadn't done my research I'd got over enthusiastic because I'd seen this buzzard but buzzards in Nottinghamshire at that time you were probably talking one buzzard for every 10 or 15 square kilometres if that Whereas now, you know, it's every one, perhaps two kilometres, there's a, a, a buzzard or a pair of buzzards because they've come back so well in this area. What I should have actually done is gone over to the west, to Wales or to the Lake District, where the density was much bigger and I would have had a much better chance of getting, getting that picture. So researching your subject can often mean that as a, a less mobile wildlife photographer you can cut out a lot of the heartache and a lot of the effort I mean a perfect example is things like deer in in the rut you know if you wanted to take a picture of um, red deer yeah you can see them all year round but the best time to see them is during the rut and the reason for that is they all gather together and also the mines on something else so they're not as interested in you as a photographer now you know that that's a you know quite a simple a simple um, example, but it, it proves the point that if you don't do your research, you can probably spend all your time wandering round, wondering why that animal's not turning up. Um, so yeah, do really do your research, and you can do a lot of that while you're sat at a computer or just reading a book, and then just when you've done all that research, it can take you straight to the to the animal that you're wanting to get an image of, and you've you've basically moved, removed a load of those variables. Right, that's my five tips for photographers who are less mobile to get out and do some wildlife photography. Now, uh, I hope you found them useful. The thing that struck me while I've been compiling this list really is that um, as photographers, none of us are exactly the same. We're all different. We've all got different abilities, not just in mobility, but every, obviously everything else. We're all, all different. Um, so I hope that with that in mind that everybody's been able to take at least one tip away from this that they can use in their own photography. You know, and if it gets a couple of you out there doing some wildlife when you think that you couldn't, you know, all well and good. I hope that's really helped. Now I'm also aware that those five tips are the ones that I thought um, leapt into my mind straight away, but there are obviously going to be loads of others and there may be other photographers out there who've thinking about it think well actually yeah I've got round that because I've got that issue but I've got round it by doing this now please if you've got any tips like that stick them in the comments below because not only does you know it may help me uh, put another video together for everybody to look at but people do look at the comments and if it helps somebody else then you know um, you know that's all well and good that's really what I wanted to try and do with this video is sort of try and make wildlife photography more inclusive for everybody as it should be anyway that's me done for this video I hope you've enjoyed it um, if you have please please give it a thumbs up I will see you next time fairly shortly for another video and uh, if you've not subscribed to the channel please subscribe and I will see you soon so yeah stay safe everybody and I'll see you for the next one Such perfection, man. Such an is